you said senior level C4D? Senior four, the, the basic way I describe it is it's, it's a senior level motion graphics general. So someone who understands cinema oh, and just, understands After Effects. They don't have to be a designer per se, but they can be design friendly. Um, they do need to have the ability, basically what's happening is I'm, my position's morphing a little bit where I'm doing a lot more pitching and a lot more traveling, um, a lot more of the traditional CD role versus a kind of um, the head of the motion graphics pipeline, which is great. So I, I, I'm a lot more involved with the creative from the beginning and kind of building the relationship with the client. Hmm. But what's happening now is because we have no other 3D people in the company, let alone um, in Chicago, and we have a very small crew of animators, of After Effects people, um, I'm looking for a senior that I can bring in that will allow me to spend a lot more time bringing in junior artists. So the hmm. goal, the really like kind of midterm goal is, short-term goal is find a senior motion graphics general. The midterm goal is that person will allow me to spend more time bringing in three to four apprentices. Um, that have a wide spectrum of skills that don't have to have, you know, um, all four of them that don't all have to be cinema and after effects. Some of, some of, one of them might even just be a great photographer that wants to learn animation. One may be a really great designer, um, print designer that's great at type, but doesn't do any cinema. Um, I'm trying to find a, a nice spectrum of multiple artists, you know, maybe an illustrator, maybe a designer, an animator, and then someone who's just more like visually, just really talented visually. He's a great mm -hmm. shooter, maybe have a little bit of editing skills, a little bit of photography, and put the four of them kind of in like a, a friendly pressure cooker where they're all trying to learn from each other. And I can spend more time with them, kind of uh, teaching them, kind of casting them on the correct job, um, using them on pitches. It's not a um, it's not necessarily a position that would be considered like an intern. It's actually people who graduated, people who are looking for a job. Um, but I'm trying really desperately to decouple um, the, the job descriptions and the pay grade and the freelance versus staff um, from, from just bringing in great people. Um, so the idea is that whether or not we have work for four, three to four people or not at the time, we basically sign three or four people up for three month long contracts, like a quarterly based contract where it's like you're a freelancer, um, we're going to use you to the best of your abilities, regardless of what's flowing in, um, even if it means we start doing some self motivated work again at DK, if there's not, you know, a pitch that's appropriate for you, we, we may use you to help us uh, redesign our logo or do a new title card for a reel or help us edit a new reel or um, create a few more hidden pieces that help kind of buffer our kind of animation reel. Um, and then at the end of those three months, evaluate those four people, um, let some people move on if they want to move on. If there's anybody that's worth kind of like that we really feel a strong connection to, we bring them back for another three month run while we backfill those other apprenticeships. Um, and then at the end of two kind of rounds, the goal would be to be able to identify people we can hire as staff as kind of junior artists that can be efficient here, that, that can work through. But we're constantly kind of just touching base with more and more younger artists, more and more artists from more disciplines other than just cinema. I'd love to be able to get some people that are really interested in doing real time or people that are doing um, interactive or experiential um, and get them access to the kinds of jobs we have that typically yeah. go to really, really talented, really, really senior um, freelancers that, you know, that work is great to come in and we do it, but the knowledge and the information kind of goes out with the freelancers as they leave. We'd love to kind of try to keep some of that, kind of stick to our, stick to our bones a little bit. Um, but to be able to do that, I need to find a senior artist that can free up some of my time. So I'm not just literally in deadline or on the box or, you know, like troubleshooting stuff as well as I'm doing some mm. other responsibilities. Yeah. And no shortage of the young, promising junior mm. artists, but trouble filling the senior role. I mean, that's a little surprising. It's, is it just you just can't lure people out of Los Angeles or they're not in Chicago? Yeah. What's, I think, you know. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a combination of all of those. I think part of it is, you know, it's the winter in Chicago still. So mm -hmm. besides myself, I don't know a lot of people that are super excited about moving to Chicago in the winter. <laughs> I'm, I, this is a, it's a little bit past yeah. my one year anniversary. So I've been here through now two winters. Um, and it's definitely difficult. Last year was very, very mild. But this year, I found myself really getting frustrated without realizing it. Like, why am I so angry? And like, I've been inside for two months. I haven't been <laughs> yeah. angry at all. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I think Chicago has a, a much wider base of freelancers from when I left to when I came back, thanks to kind of, you know, Grace Gavrilla and the Campbell and that kind of general influence. There's a lot of people picking up cinema. There's a lot yeah. of people who are just kind of getting their head around, getting their feet underneath them for, for After Effects and being a working professional motion graphics artist. Um, but I do think, you know, I, I've done tours with all the schools here and short of one of the schools, I don't think there's a lot of um, fundamentals um, being yeah. really taught or, it's taught it's just very cursory it's not very um it's not a deep dive and it's not integrated into the work that they do later you know it's kind of like here's color theory here's typography 
maybe here's a photography class, but get you through those as fast as possible to be like, here's my, here's cinema, mm -hmm. learn all the tools, learn all the buttons. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of it. I don't really feel like there's like the art center, SCAD, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of all the other schools. That, I mean, that's that, surprising that, given Chicago's size, I would assume world-class art school. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. I don't feel like they're they're integrating really well. The, maybe the animation programs are not integrated with the kind of core um, art fundamentals programs from they should be, but it definitely, I mean, I see people coming out of mm -hmm. taking three semesters of MoGraph Mentor or taking the, even like the design boot camp coming out of, um, excuse me, School of Motion. And I see uh, more and more people having, you know, like starting to, to level up. But I, I don't, I think there's, um, DePaul University has a, an interesting animation program here that I didn't know anything about. I was just at a little film festival last night and saw um, mixed in with a lot of live action projects, three, three different, very different animation um, mm -hmm. shorts that um, were exciting to see that I don't feel like I've seen from like Columbia or uh, School of the Art Institute or mm -hmm. um, Flashpoint or the AI schools here. So that, that's prompting. It's part of it's just trying to get the, get to where everyone's at. But um, I also don't think that there's a, like a very specific motion graphics program in and around Chicago. I think that's mm -hmm. missing. There may be like an animation in the sense that I want to work at Pixar and there may be some great design, um, like kind of doing print design work for agency kind of programs. But um, I don't feel like there's anything geared towards motion graphics like I've seen out of Art Center or SCAD or even, you know, like MoGraph Mentors training. Hmm. Yeah, I know sometimes a motion media program, in my experience, some of it looks like it veers more towards, um, you know, visual effects, editing, kind of a technical perspective which is certainly valuable in its own right but yeah i guess this certain type of artist that's way more design illustration visual art heavy mm -hmm. um maybe that is even more niche than i realize sometimes it's just like confined to maybe a couple um, of the institutions and then just a lot of online stuff as well yeah. um but i mean it's definitely surprising to hear you're having this much trouble um you know, assuming the wages are good, and such this huge supply, that seems to be mostly the story. Everyone's feeling like supply is increasing. Everybody's getting involved in these disciplines now, mm -hmm. um, but you can't give money away. So it definitely is surprising yeah. a little bit. I don't know, man. I, I, I think the demand far, the demand for the work is far out supplying the, the actual supply of talented, qualified artists. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've talked to you guys in New York and teams in LA and, you know, I won't name the names of studios, but studios that we all know and love and wish we could work at are all having the same problem trying to find no shortage of entry level people hungry to work, um, which kind of also points at us probably not doing a good enough job creating work that people can be trained on, which mm -hmm. is part of the initiative for like trying to create an apprenticeship program here. Um, but that kind of like mid-level senior that isn't necessarily a creative director, isn't ready to get off the box yet isn't necessarily seasoned enough to be put in front of a client as the company facing kind of advocate um, in, in those relationships. But um, that kind of like art director or multi-talented general that can essentially take, take the reins for a project for two to three days while you're off doing something else. Like if I start on Monday, I get my team direction. I'm on uh, another job for flying out Tuesday and Wednesday. I, I need a person that could keep the machine running and keep the artist kind of um, in line for those two days. You know, it, it, it it's almost like the sergeant to someone's lieutenant. And that I think is very, um, it's very, there's a shortage of it. I think um, mm -hmm. in the secondary markets, which I still consider Chicago a secondary market in after a year of kind of seeing how things are working. Um, I think that there's such a demand for work um, and that there's such a small supply that a lot of those senior level people, it's too easy to just say freelance. You have too much control. Yeah. You can write your own kind of way in terms of the, the work you want to do, how much you want to get paid. Um, when you want time off, when you want to travel for work, um, it's just, there's probably, at least in my experience in the year, seven or eight really good, what I call middleweight um, C40 freelancers here. Um, there's probably a few more After Effects people, but I think that there's only like, honestly, two or three that we've been exposed to in, in like 12, 14 months, two or three heavyweight, um, mm -hmm. what I would call general, heavyweight journals that can approach a job, kind of get the interaction, go be self-motivated for a couple of days. And honestly, one of those guys just got taken off the market. He just uh, signed up to be a creative director at the mill. So that, that pool just seemed to shrink and shrink and shrink. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the impetus of for doing the, the apprenticeship program is that we can kind of mm -hmm. in-house train those people and hopefully give them opportunities and 
through us giving them that opportunity to level up very quickly, hopefully we create some loyalty and find some people that want to go to that. Yeah. Hmm. So it's out there, man. I, I, I can't tell you. I've been doing this thing where I talk to like between two and four people a day for like the last, I'd say like six weeks at lunch. I just open up office hours and there, there are so many people that are just like, how do I do it? What's the next step? How do I go from being you know a, a student to a, a professional? How do yeah. I go from being freelance to staff? And, and there's definitely people out there. Um, but there, I think that there's short of like what you guys and Joey are doing. There's not a lot of examples for how to make that step and that next step and that next step. Um, so I've been doing tons of real reviews and tons of, I almost, I, I won't call it therapy, but definitely tons of kind of um, like, again, the best word is it, really turning to mentoring people, like yeah. evaluating where someone's at, asking what they really dig, um, asking what they want to do and helping them even define like, oh, what you're saying is actually a generalist or you think you're just a motion average person, but um, the way you're talking, the way you're thinking, you're actually saying you're, you want to be a creative director and you don't realize it yet. Um, or, you know, you're actually talking about starting your own company. You know, your frustrations are leading to something that's way more into being kind of an entrepreneur versus being just a, a worker. Um, so it's been really exciting to see like the last six weeks of where people tend are in. Some confusion amongst people about where they fit into that. Um, so I think that's probably very valuable. You giving people some clarity from your perspective about, yeah, even just kind of basic terminology of where they would fit in a larger sense of people, you know, producing work. But, you know, I think you talking a little bit about just how attractive it is to freelance now. It's like, mm -hmm. that seems like it's definitely going to continue to be an issue for big companies because it really does seem this position um, to be the freelancer, try to have as good a portfolio as possible so that, you know, Ryan has to call you up and say, hey, can you come do three months because we can't get anybody to, you know, settle down long enough. Um, and for those top tier people, yeah, maybe they do want to be in LA or have that freedom to just kind of bounce around. Yeah. And I do wonder yeah. about from your side of it, how you think it's going to go for large companies going forward, um, They're, you know, just going to have to increase wages, I assume, to get people to stay in place, make the jobs as attractive as possible. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think companies like, um, like a DK or imaginary forces or a blind, or that, that, that era and that size of company, um, I think we're going to have to to not just kind of grow to match the speed of the industry. I think we really need to um, radically change the way we, we approach employment, the way we approach artists, the way we approach work in general, because um, the old ways don't work. Um, that I, I agree and disagree with a lot of things that Chris talks about, Chris Doe talks about, um, but I do think that we can quickly become leaders in, in being much more flexible and in much more um, uh, approachable with the way we work. Um, I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to do it or I don't know how to be able to, but I would love to start um, hiring remote freelancers as staff. Um, I, I have two very reliable remote freelancers that I honestly rely on quite a bit um, for work that I think are the most professional communicators I've ever met. Um, and, and I only, one of them I only met for for real last week, we invited a lot of our freelancers that worked with us last year to come to Chicago and a couple of people drove in, a couple of people flew in, a bunch of other people um, that are working in other places right now. Um, we all met and we, we uh, played whirly ball and we had drinks and we just did a lot of talking about, you know, the last years worth of work and what we want to see going forward. And um, I think that there is a way for these older companies to avoid the crunch. I've talked about it many times before, but avoid the crunch of, of visual effects companies and much larger production companies coming down and, and stealing the big, you know, giant whale type jobs from us. And the rise of the two or three man shops just rocking octane and working in co-working spaces, taking a lot of the, the low hanging fruit that really was the engine of a lot of um, our capability to do things like title sequences or to do personal projects. Um, I think we can be much more flexible than we used to be, but I, I, I think it's yeah. going to require um, a lot of humility. Um, but yeah, I would love to do that. I, I think um, doing things like this, reaching out to, and yesterday I talked to people all around the world, you know, kind of rekindling that MoGraph mentor spirit of, of talking to people everywhere. Um, I talked to people in Europe, someone in Asia, two people in the States um, during my lunch break, um, and, and just hearing how people are being affected by the industry and where their, their hopes are. Um, I think companies need to start adopting that, start reaching out, not just going to say like, oh, we'll go once a year to a portfolio show at the four schools that are in our city and you know, we'll try to talk to people and we'll just take the best people that are physically available. There's a lot of amazing, talented people doing very different things that just don't happen to be in the same time zone as you. 
Um, I think that's going to be a, a huge opportunity. I think um, starting to white label smaller collectives of artists within the company is a big option. Um, so if there's four or five people that you keep on seeing working together, um, but they may not actually own a company, um, looking for a way to kind of bring them in on projects that um, they're not necessarily DK employees, but they're being used as you know almost a a freelance company, but you're you're kind of coalescing them together, finding their strength, elevating them, giving opportunities for jobs they would never never get on their own. Um, and, and that's a double-edged sword. They may go out and start their own company and become your competition. Um, one of them may want to come staff because they love the kind of experiences. Um, but I think as, as large companies grow, we are going to have to kind of do it. I think what we have a huge uh, capability to do is to create um, to create opportunity cost. Like for someone to say like, oh man, like I could feed your lamp, but I might just be working on explainer videos or a yeah. one-man kind of like product shot. But I could go to somebody like DK and I might be able to work for three months on a project that um, is on a scale and scope I never work at. I think we need to start leveraging that and kind of using that as our, our our advertising. Like we have the chance to level people up, and if we create great environments, they may want to stay here, or they may want to tell other people if they're working somewhere else that DK allowed them to move up. Um, but it, again, I think it's going to take a lot of humility for companies to realize that just because they're the place that did a cool title sequence three years ago, that doesn't mean people are going to knock on the door to come work there. Yeah, yeah. I wonder kind of what the almost flow of money looks like now in terms of the largest clients or the largest agencies mm -hmm. and then some of like are they just in the right place in money in the pyramid that it's like they still are a conduit that you need to go through they're going to get the biggest jobs or mm -hmm. or is it yeah lots of small is that starting to diffuse and put more pressure on these you know these bigger companies um, I mean, I can tell you the big companies are feeling a lot of pressure. I think that, um, like I was saying, if, if you imagine you're getting this pressure from above, like I, I, on a giant Super Bowl uh, commercial with live action and huge visual effects in a short timeline, um, I can't spin up a 40-person team to work for three weeks um, and compete with somebody like The Mill or Method. Um, that, that's just not, that's not what we were built to do. That's not what we've done before. It, whereas maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, super old jobs could be kind of competed against. Um, so we're feeling that squeeze from above and then again, like the, the pressure from below. Um, but the natural progression is to just kind of start to stretch out. And, and honestly, that's what we're seeing. I think we're seeing is that we are starting to approach almost becoming more of a, um, subject matter expert mm -hmm. and finding a lot of projects or canvases for lack of a better word that um, use our skill sets, our, our widely disparate skill sets um, for people who have never worked with um, agencies before or never worked with production studios before, um, mm -hmm. which is why you're starting to see places like DK and I'm sure other places as well, um, starting to reach into the interactive world and the experiential world and the kind of, I just call it space and place. Um, there's mm -hmm. a lot of fancy words, but I just think like we are very good at taking empty spaces and turning them into places that you talk about and places that you want to visit. Um, short of one title sequence I did last Christmas that was just a very quick like 10 second 2D animation piece. Almost every job here has been trying to create um, affinity for a place, trying to create rituals for a, um, a place. So whether it's a sports entertainment complex that we're doing something way beyond just like the Get Loud videos, but creating ritual, creating um, an environment that can take a team that's just been spooled out of thin air and make it feel like it's the Yankees of soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, a team that's been, it, we made a team that was brand new feel like they've been around for 20 years and that's more than just pushing buttons in cinema that, that's working with a client and crafting story um crafting belonging for lack of a better term um i think that that's what's going to happen with a lot of these larger companies is that the traditional work is going to go to other people um whether it's because your overhead's so high because you've been around for so long um but i think that we can still get some of that work to maintain kind of our our what we we are known for you know we'll still always do title sequences we'll still always do um very uh, esoteric 3d animation that looks photorealistic for for, for some clients um but we're going to do a lot less of that and we're going to do more working with people in very i mean it, my jobs have been los angeles atlanta tokyo abu dhabi probably um two or three other countries in the middle east probably another country by the end of the year in mm. southeast asia um, it's really kind of, again, stretching, stretching the physical location, stretching the, the scope of the work. Um, 
kind of being a connector as well, finding um, disparate people that would never get access again to, to these large canvases and helping orchestrate, you know, a small four-man interactive shop with three great illustrators ma matched with two of our amazing animators and our kind of um, expertise in tying all this together. Um, three years ago, that's nothing that DK would never have done something like that. Hmm. Um, and, you know, this newer global economy that we're in for the last 40 years where it's perfectly reasonable that you in Chicago would be working for clients in Tokyo. Um, that just presents such a huge potential upside for just for communications work generally, just the work of designing and making things. And, um, you know, one thing I really think is true about our line of work is, you know, it's the demand side is growing, but then there's always something new to say. It's like, yeah. to, you know, the client in Japan doesn't want to make one commercial. They need to make four a year, every single year, and then a million other smaller pieces um, of communication. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see how it, how it goes in the future, but we could switch gears a little bit um, and talk about Twitter. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. I have been, I've been using it a lot less, I think. Yeah. Um, I think probably a lot of people seem like they're kind of having, you know, mixed feelings about it. I, you know, it's basically like a big Rolodex where it's like, you know, everybody I know is on there. So it's like, it's mm -hmm. this amazing tool um, that really is incredible. But at the same time, you know, I think it was the Mo chat maybe two weeks ago, kind of about toxicity or mm -hmm. negativity or cynicism. Um, and... You know, I don't know that there's much to say about it other than what's been said of some people just like to use the platform to shit on stuff and like be cynical and like yeah. <laughs> that's the right to do that and you don't have to follow it and it can mute it and like you can totally curate what Twitter is because um, you know like all my corporate friends who sell insurance don't have like inter-industry squabbles <laughs> or like yeah. things like that so I think we're a little unique in that regard too but mm -hmm. Um, you are a prolific tweeter. I'd say you're very good at Twitter, just in terms of using it to connect with people. And, you know, you're always, you know, good film critique and making observations and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I just wonder how you're feeling about Twitter. Do you feel inspired to want to use it? Or do you reach a point of like, actually, I'd rather not look at it for a while? Yeah, I think um, I think they're all really good points. That Mo chat was kind of amazing because it, it had been kind of quiet for a couple of weeks, and I feel like that we that talk and those talks just yesterday both kind of exploded a little bit. I think um, I have a lot of opinions on a lot of point of views from it, but I I still love Twitter. I still think it's um, it's an amazing way to ingratiate yourself very quickly with a community that may know nothing about you. Um, if you don't, <laughs> if you use networking as a way to not think about networking, right? Like I love. Twitter because I can be inspired, I can make communication, um, I can connect with people, I can discover people. Um, but I do think that from whenever I started seven or eight years ago to now, um, there's so much noise. The signal to noise ratio is insane, um, yeah. which is why I think you see people running to things like Slack or Discord um, or kind of private, private channels or um, even just having like larger groups on DMs and Twitter. Um, or just like groups of iMessage, you know, I, I have probably three or four different sets of four or five people on iMessage where we share stuff as much as I probably used to two years ago on Twitter. Um, I kind of adopted the uh, Twitter has an ability to kind of create Twitter lists of people that um, you want to assign to different kind of subject matter. And right now, I think you can hit a critical mass where if you follow too many people, it just feels like it's all garbage or it's all negative or it's all mudslinging, um, which I was starting to feel a little bit at the beginning of the year. So I kind of created a, a MoGraph Twitter list and started asking people if they wanted to be added to it. And I've honestly found that um, I probably spend half as much time on Twitter now kind of having this kind of tight curated list, but I, I'm having way much more fun than I did at the end of last year um, mm -hmm. because I'm not checking as much because it's, it's maybe 200, 300, 400 people. It's not a couple thousand, um, but it's also fairly focused. Not that it's like-minded people. People still disagree, but at least I'm using it like you know what i'm really on twitter because i love motion graphics and i love talking about movies so i have two separate lists that i can kind of just flip back and forth through and then i still have all the people that i've compiled that have said something interesting at one point that are my kind of main section but it lets me just be way more focused and if i'm like i just want to yeah. put my finger to the pulse of like motion graphics right now i can just hop in there check make a couple comments talk to people um but i do think you have to kind of be you have to own that right like some people have asked like how do i get six thousand followers in like x amount of time and I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think that's the same problem that you see 
um, people spending ten thousand dollars a month to become Instagram famous, and then six months later going bankrupt and being like, I only have three thousand followers. Because <laughs> the motivation is very yeah. apparent. I think people can see it and feel it. Um, I've seen I've seen some people. You know, like I, there's a guy um, TJ um, that went through uh, Mograph Mentor, who I just loved his his energy and his spirit. And he's always very um, he's sharing. You can feel his enthusiasm coming through Twitter when you see him. And I always point to him as someone that I, yeah. I love. As yeah. a great example of somebody who networks without making it feel corporate. He, he doesn't feel like someone who's like got a list mm-hmm. every day and he's got to make six messages and he schedules them. It just is his energy. When I worked with him in class, like he was just excited. He was sharing stuff. He was asking questions. He was trying to help people, even if he didn't have the answer. He was looking to connect people together. Um, and, and I've had people actually privately get mad at me. Like, why are you always talking about TJ? Or why are you, why are you telling people that they need to spend time on Twitter? And I'm like, no, like... That's just naturally what this person does. He has it in him, and I think he's a good yeah. example of it. Um, but I think that kind of takes us to, to something I've been feeling a lot lately, is that there is this almost, um, for lack of a better term, like PTSD about social media that I think people have been experiencing lately. Mm-hmm. Where, um, And I think a lot of it is, is, is built out of false things, but there's a combination of this industry is still, I feel like, going through its first wave of people maturing, right? Hmm. Like, there's no 60-year-old master I can ask. There's no Neil Young of motion graphics that I can knock on his door and be like, Neil, how do I figure this out? Like, what? how do I get to where you got? The, like, I, I feel like we're all part of the first generation trying to figure out, like, how to make a career and a life out of motion graphics. Um, and what I'm starting to find is that there's some people that probably were here probably five to ten years before I was, and they... They're, they were able to make their claim on being part of this industry because they adopted technology before anyone else. And that that's always what's gotten them where they're going. That's always been their advantage. That's always been their leverage. And then at some point, they kind of have slowed down. And they've not, not necessarily rested on their laurels, but they learned what they learned and they're able to make a good living doing it. But now there's been a wave of new technology. So we start to see Houdini come in. And we start to see Octane, Redshift, Corona, Tachyon, every possible render technology come in. And it's taking things that used to be tricks that were kind of clandestine and not easy to figure out. And it's basically given a beautiful UX and much more render power to things that people made their whole careers on saying, I can do photorealistic rendering and you can't. And they don't necessarily share their information. So there's this kind of generation, I think, of people that don't feel like they see a place for themselves. And I, I honestly mm-hmm. think it really does. It comes down to the, the separation between being a technician and being an artist. And it's mm-hmm. not saying either is right or either is wrong. But if you're going to be a technician, if you're going to take this claim on technology, then you better be prepared that you're always going to be learning. You're always going to be evaluating because that's what an artist does as well. An artist doesn't just go to school for four years and say, that's it. I've learned it all. And they just, you know, free ride the rest of their career. They're always learning and adapting and finding connections from old and the new and taking their failures and, you know, trying to find something that that is positive about it and craft a new skill set. Um, I'm starting to see people that are like 15 years into this industry that are very bitter, that are very resentful, that they don't understand why they're not getting as many knocks on the door, why their reels aren't being considered as as, um, highly as uh, people 10 years their junior. Um, And I think part of it is that the time is running out for people who are just technicians that have been built their experience on the back of where the industry was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and, And it's not unique to us, right? Like I worked in the animation industry at the very beginning of my career with people who worked at Disney who refused to learn Flash, who refused to animate on a Wacom. And those people within two years were asked to leave. They weren't, or they weren't brought back um, because the, the industry moves on. And they are amazing animators, blow away the best animators in the motion graphics industry. Um, mm-hmm. But they don't work anymore uh, because they just, they felt like they learned everything they were supposed to learn. And now they're supposed to kind of be kind of getting the, the um, benefits of, of all that hard work. It's never going to be easy. Our industry is never going to be a moment where you're like, all right, I got it, kick back and just kind of fail. Like if you do that, it, it, it's going to pass you by. Um, and I feel like that's what I'm seeing on social media. A lot of the kind of um, resentment and anger and frustration is a byproduct of that. Um, and then there's a lot of younger people who are like, look, I'm, I'm finding work. I'm posting things on Instagram. I'm, I'm finding jobs from Dribbble, um, non-traditional places that um, people just don't want to try to keep up with. Yeah, I mean, yes, I agree. I agree with that assessment. Um, it's just so interesting that like economic displacement and change has just been this constant theme, you know, mm-hmm. in, in America and in Western, um, really all societies, I guess. Um, 
you know, I love history and I love to read about how disruptive it was during the industrial revolution when everyone kind of went from farming and then into cities into like industrial production. Um, I love to try to understand everything that's happened over the last 40 years with just manufacturing in this country. You know, the guy who's got a good life and a supposedly good pension and he's in Detroit and then globalization comes and suddenly, you know, the banks don't need workers in Michigan anymore. Right. They have workers somewhere else. And I do actually wonder about that. It seems obvious to say it, that knowledge workers are going to experience their own kind of um, international kind of competition too for the things that we do. And, you know, the distinction between, right, being kind of a more technical, having a specific technical expertise versus being the artist or the design thinker, design strategist, big picture stuff. Um, it's probably a very important distinction. I think that's the distinction Chris was trying to make with his bricklayer. Yeah, comment. yeah. I didn't, that... want to inv I didn't want to invoke it, but um, because I'm firmly on one side of that that conversation, and I, I honestly feel like his his issue was honestly an issue of semantics. Like, I think he posed it in a combative way that would create exactly what it created. We're still a year and a half later <laughs> in talking about it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think part of the problem is Chris will will talk about it and, and then just kind of like shrug his shoulders and walk back. Like, well, I didn't mean to do it. But I think he honestly very much, whether or not it was fully intentional or not, it, it's in his um, his skill set and his game plan to kind of create a fire and then take two steps back and point like, wow, it's really burning pretty bright, right? Mm -hmm. But then walk everybody towards it. I don't think that there was was anything that isn't true in the sentiment, but I think the way he said it didn't allow anyone to hear his message at yeah. all. I think it was completely wrong. Yeah, I mean, the observation though, that just any kind of, if you're, if the way that you get paid is an understanding of a technical set of steps, whether it's mm -hmm. assembling a Dodge Ram or opening Photoshop and doing something specific, it does, it, like the trends would seem to be pointing to that's something that could be disintermediated over and over and over as technology changes and you're linking yourself to yeah. some, to a specific set of steps. And um, that's going to be a problem. I mean, that's going to be a, a pretty big issue, I think, just because then I wonder like, what is the capacity for employment on the artist side or the design thinking side? Like, you know, for every one creative director and needing 10, technicians to execute something like what does that ratio look like going forward it's, yeah. it's also easy to imagine new technologies that just totally wipe out a set of technical steps so like yeah. i did a i did a bunch of 2d explainer videos like right when i was kind of first learning and freelancing and you know now i'll go on product hunt every now and again and see some group of geniuses in san francisco creating some yeah. app that basically outputs something that looks pretty identical to the stuff that I was charging money for maybe like six years ago. Yeah. Um, and it's like that, there's not going to be any stopping that. That's going to happen. That yeah. definitely is. Um, but again, it's not new. It's like part of this is, this is happening in all industries all the time. So the distinction yeah. between how you're going to be valuable in it, I think is probably pretty important to talk to students about, yeah. at least like in the MoGraph mentor context, so that you don't build any false illusion that like, yeah, just make 2D stuff. Like as long as you can do some kinetic type, you're definitely going to make 60K a year going forward for the next 25 years. So, no. you know, you're going to be set to build on that skill. So it's like, actually, probably not. You're going to have to go to a higher order level of thinking, be more of a problem solver. Um, diversify the things that you know how to do. Maybe if one set of technical processes is getting automated in a specific way, you have to kind of bro broaden that out and say yeah. like, well, I can do lots of technical processes and I can see the big picture stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I think we, it, there's a word we used earlier. I think the whole issue that's floating around comes down to two, two words. One of them was the word we said earlier with humility. I think being able to take a step back from your own ego, take a, step back from the hard work that you put down the box um, and being able to look at your reel and ask the question, am I solving a problem that can't be solved by anyone other than me? Like, like, like the hard 
cold truth of our industry right now is that we are a service industry. If someone asks for something to be solved and we find a either most efficient or most beautiful way to solve it. And for most people that are getting in the industry, the type of work they're doing right now is, is it the most efficient? And, and for the lucky few of us, which isn't even me, like quite often I'm doing the exact same thing. And occasionally we get a, a person that's more like a patron than they are like a, a client and they want the most beautiful thing. But, um, but I think that's what it really comes down to is like, if you're looking at something and a plugin from After Effects or from AE Scripts pops up and it automates 50% of what you do, you have to be able to be humble enough to say, wow, what I was doing was not that difficult of a problem to solve. Um, mm. But if what you're doing is someone has a product and they don't understand what the pain point is for the client or for the, for the customer to understand its utility or to understand its need in the market, um, that's something that not many automated, deep thinking AI neural networks can solve. Like right now, explainer videos are fine, but at some point, every explainer video that can be animated has been animated a million times. Like, I don't need to ever see another person show me their version of a hand swiping an app on a phone. Like, <laughs> honestly, like I can, I can, yeah. I know it, it, you know, and if you do it, don't show it three times on a demo reel in three different styles. Mm -hmm. um, but there's only so many super simple rubber hose, characters walking left to right, picking something up, handing something to someone, and then um, an automated mind map showing up above it, like at some point you have to be humble enough to say, I worked very hard, but this is something easily replicable. Um, and ask yourself, you know, do you want to keep on pounding the pavement to do the kind of entry level work or do you want to find a way to do something more? Um, I think a lot of people don't look at their work and look at it with the deep critical analysis that that clients look at my our demo reel for a company or um, I would look at a freelancer to hire them to come in and do something. Um, it, it, it's not, there's never going to be a time where today is going to be the same as tomorrow. Um, and, and to think that it's going to just get better um, without growing or changing or leveling up, I think is very, very short-sighted. And it's very, it's very egotistic um, to think that that's the possibility. I mean, I've changed careers and, and changed skill sets and, and continue learning to the point where now it's my favorite thing. You know, mm -hmm. looking and hunting for the next challenge or looking and hunting for the next style or trying to find what the next thing is to learn has actually become, I think, why I'm a good creative director, um, besides my ability to listen and problem solve. Um, but you have to embrace it. You know, and I think, again, that comes down to the, the distinction between someone who's technically minded um, in terms of their core identity versus someone who's artistically minded. Um, and not to say that you can't have a career, but you just need to be prepared that that's going to be your task in life, is to continue to learn new technology, to continue to learn new techniques, if that's what you, you posit yourself as to the world. Sure. And which is entirely legitimate too, you know, yeah, of absolutely. people, I think it's probably smart to be studying unity development type stuff now, like understanding some of that side of it. Um, yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, okay. Design contests. Are they, uh, are they innocuous? Do they not matter? Or is it a menace that is destroying, uh, destroying jobs and destroying wages? Um, I hate design contests, um, mostly because they, they lower the bar that's already pretty low to an even lower level. Um, I also think that most people who get extremely upset about design contests don't have any perspective on the people that they're aimed for. Um, and, and uh, I mean, we can talk about what I'm sure you're aiming at. Um, the whole red giant, they might be giant, kind of whatever you want to call it, the blow up that happened. Um, I think there's a good amount of people just trying to blanket every situation with the same brush so that they can get on their soapbox and, mm -hmm. and beat their chest. Um, I know for whatever reason, a lot of people who get worried about swipes approach me about how do I, how do I find a way to kind of confront this or bring it up. And, and I, don't, I don't jump on every mm -hmm. single time someone says someone ripped off a style frame I did eight years ago. Um, there are ones that are so egregious, that are so offensive, that are... Such, um, such issues where it's such a large company taking advantage of such a small company that I feel like it's worth trying to um, bring more light or elevate the situation up. Um, I think there's obvious ones, right? Like Fiverr is, is gross, right? Like it, it's disgusting to, to throw 90 people. Is that the logo? Is that like the logo site where you pay $5? So, yeah, th there's several of them. Um, but but I, I think it's really easy to say all things are evil or all things are great. Um, I think we're living in a very binary, very divisive, very um, um, algorithmically opposed civilization right now where, where there's money to be made in friction. 
Um, so I, I, I agree that there are things to get mad about. And I think the conversation about the um, red giant and they might be giants thing was, was healthy for a little while saying like, hey, um, ha has anybody looked at the terms of, uh, of agreement to see like, uh, if you do this work, are you giving everything away? Um, you know, or, or is, does Red Giant understand, you know, how, how it could be perceived as being completely um, one-sided? But if you actually started looking at it, you started looking at what was going on, um, they weren't taking any ownership. They were looking for people to partner up. Um, they were looking to elevate the person who ended up actually winning it. Um, I also don't think people are making a living trying to create music videos for 25-year-old um, semi-famous bands. Um, Anybody who's getting upset that the the um, budgets for music videos are going to get dramatically pushed down because this one contest has no concept or understanding at all of what the budgets for music videos actually are. There are no there, there's no budget. Um, if you talk to someone who directs videos for Britney Spears or Taylor Swift, um, you'll find out that either Taylor herself funds these these videos or a lot of the money is actually coming out of the budget. So a lot of the budget's coming from the directors and the cinematographers and the people wanting to work on these projects as well. Um, it, it's not what you think it is. There isn't some giant company or record label pulling the strings and saying, do this job that should cost a million dollars for $5,000. Um, I know guys who direct <laughs> music videos and they're doing it as a loss leader. They're doing it as an opportunity cost to try to get a feature film or they're looking at it as a way to um, kind of increase their, their exposure to their reels. Um, it's not the same thing as saying, this incredibly financially successful company that could pay somebody to do something for fifty thousand dollars is stealing tons of work that they're going to, you know, manipulate for years to come. Um, I think it's a fine line, man. I think that there's gray in all of it. I think um, the kind of personal attacks that were aimed towards someone like Aaron, um, and if you know his history of giving to the community, um, I think it shows how incredibly um, uneducated, short-sighted, and childish people can be without doing the tiniest bit of research into who is involved and why they're involved um mm -hmm. and i think it just again shows that like we should be out there trying to protect people and trying to let people know what the, the their rights are and what their opportunity costs are but at the same time i do feel like there's there's some of us who are kind of dragging around a soapbox looking for opportunities to stand on it too um i mean i i also i kind of made a whole thing about in the, the mo chat post that like if you want to throw shit at somebody um, maybe stop and imagine if you're actually seeing the things you're seeing, the way you're seeing them to someone in person. And if that gives you any kind of pause, it's probably not the best thing to say online. It's better probably to do what we're doing right here. Call someone up, get someone's phone number, email them and say, hey, maybe with the vitriol that you have, but do it in fucking private, do it in person and say, look, I think this is bullshit. Can you explain to me why you think this is right? Um, versus very ignorantly um, trying to disparage someone without understanding the full situation. Yeah. No, that's certainly good wisdom. And there's uh, certainly no shortage of uh, moralizing and virtue signaling and soapboxing. And I've, I've done my own bit of it on Twitter. And oh, I think we all do. I mean, it, I, I definitely know. I know. I mean, I've had private conversations with the guys at Motionographer about very specific instances that um, they thought I was coming at somebody with pitchforks and that I was actively looking to kind of create fires. And then I had a conversation like this explaining why I felt so strongly and how a very similar situation um, uh, of swiping basically shut down a company that um, I wish was still at the level that it, it um, was at when I was working with them. Um, and that that behavior seems to be coming so much more rampant, both from a school level, all the way to seasoned veterans level. And that if we don't as an industry say, um, you know, swiping other artists work for the benefit of ourselves without crediting or at least explaining that something's reference versus original work um, is a really bad habit not to point out that it, it has dangerous um, consequences. Yeah. Um, and after we talked, you know, like we talked like humans to each other, not just throwing arrows over the wall at each other. Um, I think we all kind of agreed and um, cooler heads prevailed. But so I get it. You know, like I definitely, you definitely have that instant reaction to something without knowing about it. And you want to be heard and you want to catch the front of the wave and not be on the back of the wave. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally get them because we all fall prey to it. But man, I just I just think like, what would you say to someone if they happened across the street and that was the person you were typing to? You know, would yeah. you would you stop and say the things the same way you're saying? Probably not. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know the best way. I don't think that's ever going to stop. I think I think people love being able to vent and kind of have some some notoriety for being the one that's doing the venting. 
I mean, the design contests um, and Fiverr are like kind of a, you know, part of the same whole, which is it's super easy to do creative now. Like everyone, not everyone, but millions and millions of people have Photoshop, have a laptop, have a camera. Um, so you, I mean, you probably have tens of millions of more people available to make things. Um, so you're going to get sites like Fiverr where someone in India will design a logo for five USD and legitimately like sit there and bang out, you know, mm -hmm. logos all day. Yeah. It's just hard to know of like, I don't know, is it, is it just the guy at General Motors just cursing the Chinese as the world changes around him because his job, like his position in it is shifting, which obviously I understand that's a terrible feeling, the sense of your coveted place uh, in the world is like being diffused in this way. And um, so, I, you know, I understand why people have this vis visceral reaction to contests and fiber and stuff, but the trend behind that is such a massive wave that it's like, I don't know, I, I find it difficult to get too upset about it more than just being fascinated at like how this moment that we, that we came into and also just our total inability to blunt this wave in any way or change this or like, or shame Fiverr to like remove cheap labor in like knowledge work or in design work. Um, that this is going to be kind of a new sorting out period where we figure out what this looks like. And um, I tend to think of the, like the music video contests that people were getting upset about. You know, I, I see it as pretty benign. I, you know, I see it as somewhat innocuous of just, um, since it's been going on for a while and it doesn't appear to be, I don't know, changing, um, changing the position of people in the United States to make a lot of money. It's like, there's contests all the time and they've been going on for years and yet many of us are still gainfully employed and doing lots of work and the demand side appears to be exploding at such an unbelievable rate that, you know, a random company here and there saying, hey, let's just try to crowdsource and get some free creative feels like such a drop in the ocean. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe it's more prolific than I understand, but it seems pretty isolated to then companies that like have some kind of inside track with like a red giant partnership specifically for creators. Um, I mean, you'll see the like Doritos pitch mm -hmm. us a Super Bowl ad. Like they want, they just want people to come up with ideas, the literal job of a creative director and they're just tossing it out. But that in and of itself doesn't appear to fundamentally change. Um, like it always seems small and like a one-off. I don't see it as a huge, more systemic yeah. I, mean, I look at that the, like something like the Doritos thing though like like you're looking at more and more people who are younger getting opportunities to in some ways I know this isn't a popular thing but in some ways you're blowing up the gatekeeper mentality that you have to have x amount of years experience regardless if it's good or bad mm -hmm. to even be considered for opportunities right like I, I'm seeing photographers who would never have the opportunity to speak with a brand um, be found uh, through Instagram or through whatever social media avenues they have and get hired to, to run um, run different kinds of um, branding runs or different kinds of jobs that they would never have access to. And it really just comes down to, you know, I think a lot of times it's mostly coming down to skill. I think occasionally people are looking for cheap labor. Um, I don't think that that necessarily um, brings down the, the, the value of the labor because nobody would, if somebody could get if a company could get a logo for $10, that company was never going to spend $50,000 on a campaign or a discovery period. Like, like, yeah, I think people are missing. You hear the big stories, right? You hear the story of like, Oh my God, they paid $10 for a logo or they bought it off of a, a stock template site. But you know what? Like if it's a company of any kind of consequence and they go to market with that, it almost immediately just as fast gets destroyed or, or gets eviscerated or the, the trust that a mark or a, a campaign or a, brand should kind of generate um, is equivalent a lot of times to the quality of the work that's put into it, right? Like if you see a poorly current title and it's on um, the front of a company, people call it out. And, and that's what happens when you pay for $5 or $10. Um, I also think people are dramatically underestimating the amount of work that is now available just because of the number of canvases that are out there. And that's going to extend on, on both sides. You know, there are going to be jobs. There are campaigns uh -oh, out there now. Breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. There are campaigns now where people are getting paid to create thousands of deliverables 
and they might be very small. But over the course of all that, there's a much larger ad spend than if they would have done one television commercial. Um, on the counter side, you're going to get fibers. You're going to get situations where people who never thought that they could have a logo created for them, um, they're going to go to the lowest common denominator. So I, I think it's something that we should be vigilant for and always aware. Um, but I think we also shouldn't forget that the people that are starting out are looking for opportunities. You know, if I was 17 years old or 18 years old and there was a band that I liked and I had an opportunity to make a music video, meet the band, get a couple thousand dollars and get all the Red Giant suite legitimately, would I not try to do that? Probably. Is that mean that that Red Giant is aiming to um, eliminate work for people who've been working for 20 years or companies that are billing $5 million a year? I don't think that's who it was aimed for. I think it was a band trying to connect. No, I think, I think, I think your point stands, though, that someone who pays $5 for the logo um, is not the Fortune 50 company that would have otherwise spent 100000 It's you know, the girl with the Etsy shop or like this new wave of someone who has a $10 logo budget, which is of course um, absurdly low compared to working with a firm. But yeah, then I wonder coming back to the demand side of it of, well, now there's millions of tiny companies that would not have existed uh, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And everybody's got a website and need, needs a logo. And um, it's hard to know definitively, but I do wonder if there could be any documented way to know if the proliferation of all the people who can design a logo has really brought down those budgets for the top companies that were doing it previously, or if, if the Fortune 500, what are, they're still paying about what they were. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that'd be a good study. I mean, I, I, I think part of it too is, you know, like I've listened to musicians talk about this and I, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but someone like Mick Jagger talked about how, um, you know, for a brief moment in time, you can make millions of dollars by putting um, 10 songs on a piece of plastic, right? Before that time, for the rest of recorded history backwards and after iTunes and, and Spotify, for the rest of time forward, you got to go out and you got to tour, right? Like there, there, there's a brief moment in time where there may have been 10 shops that could do motion graphics at an extremely high level, right? And then from that moment in time, it's basically kind of um, multiplied exponentially, right? Two people leave New Energy Forces, start another shop. Two people leave... DK, start another shop. And then three years later, five people leave and start five more shops. And then it, the tools accelerate to the point where anyone, even if you're not in college for it, can, can get your hands on $50 a month for, for the entire Adobe suite that comes with Cinema 4D. Like thinking back 10 years ago, the amount of the, the cost to just get in the door and the amount of training that was available um, was nowhere near. It was a fraction of what we have now. But that doesn't mean that people who have an artistic voice, people who have an opinion, people who want to understand a client's needs instead of complaining and bitching about them, that look at their jobs as being problem solvers until they decide that they want to make, excuse me, their own product. That is, that, that's your job. You're, that, that is what's going to happen. There are more and more people out there who are able to solve the, the technical problems. There are still not many people who know how to work creatively with a client that services an industry in, in a very unique way. Um, so that's why I think, you know, like, there will still be great work out there. Do I think the, giant jobs where you can get paid $2 million to do a 30 minute commercial or a 30 second commercial. Are those gone for the most part? Yes. Um, did they exist for more than 20 years? Probably not. You yeah. know, was that something that, that a very small handful of companies got fat on the lamb with and expected to have forever? Yes. I can tell you the companies that I've worked at that are still feeling the pains of having a business model that was built on 15 years ago as industry and not today's industry. Um, so yeah, I think, Learn how to tell stories, learn how to pro solve problems, um, learn how to talk, and more importantly, listen to people. Always enjoy um, learning new tools. Treat yourself as an artist where you allow yourself to learn and explore and find new things to enjoy. Um, get used to failing as fast as possible and celebrate it and look for the successes to build on. Um, and, and that you can have a career doing this. I don't think it's a, the sky is falling for all of us. I think when I listen to Chris Doe, doomsday about the industry i do see from his point of view from where he is at historically being around for the beginning the world looks very different from his point of view from, from that age and from that height the world doesn't look sustainable but for someone who is incredibly motivated has a little bit of an entrepreneurial background who loves tools who loves photography who has a small crew of like-minded people around them the opportunity cost is incredible right now like like five dudes with um four gpus that actually 
know how to set type and one of them knows how to shoot video and another one knows how to edit and one of them is a badass sound guy that is this is there's never been a better time to be those four people yeah no it's 100 percent true and yeah it's just a totally democratizing moment for all this stuff and um yeah that's a good place to leave it man that's good wisdom and uh i appreciate your time and i appreciate you. catching up with you and um Hope to uh, hope to see you soon. Stay warm in Chicago. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully I won't be in hoodies much longer. It's been the, the uniform for the last few months. Yeah, it's pretty cold here too. We got a few inches of snow on the ground here, and uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be your last snowfall for a while. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> awesome. Let's Go see. Ahead. Cool, man. Thanks for taking the time.